Good afternoon, everyone. Um, late to start. Um, okay, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Tom Forth, who will be uh, giving our uh, keynote on open data. Uh, so Tom's done a PhD in uh, systems biology, um, and he's been consulting in open data um, projects for government and for the um, uh, commercial sector. Uh, he's lead of challenges at the Open Data Institute Leeds, uh, and he has his own company. Uh, I'm active, um, and he uh, has done quite a lot of app development as well in the, in the, in the space of open data. So, thank so you, thank you, Osman. Thanks, everyone, for having me. Um, yes. Uh, I've added three slides of failures given earlier questions. <laughs> so uh, it's very responsive and agile uh, presentation this. Um, I am uh, one of the people who's made ODI Leeds happen. ODI Leeds is just near the bus station, Central Leeds. Uh, the man and woman in charge is Paul and Catherine Connell. What the o Open Data Institute Leeds is, is a franchise. The word that is used in a franchise agreement is a no, but it is a franchise of the Open Data Institute in London, which is a publicly funded body that promotes the use of open data. So uh, Tim Berners-Lee is in charge of that. Um, I assume we all know who Tim Berners-Lee is, given what we work in. So we are a private franchise of the Open Data Institute. What that lets us do is win bigger jobs, deliver more with open data, and send, sell and promote what we do all around the world. You're welcome to visit us. Uh, we've got events on this week. On Thursday, we've got DEFRA in for a whole day. There's a whole day of events on all of DEFRA's open data, which we've helped them to open up. We've done stuff recently with High Raise England. Um, we work a lot with quite a few private clients in Leeds. That includes a lot of the big sports and betting companies who have a lot of data, some of which they are willing to make open. And we can use that in some quite interesting ways. So I wanted to start with how I got here. So this is a Zoom back about six years ago. I was actually PhD student at the University of Leeds, about two, two minutes walk away. I used to grow <coughs> those little things. You can see the purple rings inside what is there, a blood cell. So I was growing little malaria parasites. I was smearing them out on a glass slide, staining them, measuring them, counting how quickly they grew in response to certain chemicals that we added to them to try and kill them. Uh, and that's where my interest in open data and in a big failure, which is computer vision, comes from. So I got very, very frustrated with the fact that in malaria microbiology, still to this day, people are smearing out slides and counting <coughs> malaria parasites by hand when anyone who's any good at computer vision in the last 15, 20 years could tell you that that is a done problem. But we really don't need to be counting these things by hand anymore. So I set about learning how to fix that, and you'll see some of the things that that's led on to. This is uh, the main area of study that I did. If you want to look up flux balance analysis on Wikipedia, you can, because I wrote the page. And that has been, in terms of talking about documentation of methods and software development, that has been by far the biggest success that I've ever had. So writing a Wikipedia page on what was previously a very hard to understand subject and making it somewhat less hard to understand has been extremely good for me, I think extremely good for a lot of people. Over 50,000 people have read that work far more than any scientific paper I've ever published. Um, I also put it in my PhD <laughs> thesis, which was a bold move. Uh, but sadly, the external examiner knew that I had written it, and so he didn't even bring it up. I was hoping he was going to get really angry about me citing Wikipedia as just the whole of my introduction. But in fact, I'd written it, so it was fine. Um, this is the first bit of software that I wrote. This is a piece of software that builds a metabolic network 
for the malaria parasite. So I was growing these parasites, I was adding different chemicals to kill them, and then I was creating at the same time a big metabolic network, so the collection of about 550 chemical reactions, and trying to model how the chemicals that I was adding would affect the model, and then trying to join together the model and the real life experiments I was doing. So this has some uh, good points and bad points about software and open data. It produces a beautiful open data format. This produces as an output systems biology markup language, SBML, which is uh, a really good standard for describing metabolic models. Uh, it continues, I, I think that the people that uh, the Manchester Institute for Biotechnology are very, very good at pushing that forward. Um, there's other people who help all around the world to define that standard. There's some downsides to this software in terms of sustainability, but some, I will argue, are, are upsides. So, for example, you can see that it is written in Microsoft Access, therefore you need to have a Microsoft Office on your computer. This got a lot of people really, really angry. Uh, it stopped me from publishing it for years, uh, as, a, as in publishing it as a scientific paper for years. I would suggest, though, if we look and go back, that none of the competing pieces of software still run. I tried to run them the other day, they don't run. They all have six-year-old, seven-year-old dependencies. They just don't compile anymore, they don't run, you have to go back to a seven-year-old machine. That will keep running forever. Microsoft will keep maintaining Microsoft Access forever. Yeah, it's closed software. The actual software is open, right? So you can click, view all the code, you can see all of it behind the scenes. But there were some interesting things that I learned there. <coughs> and in fact, that was one of the reasons that I uh, probably moved towards doing the Open Data Institute stuff and working with a lot more private partners. Um, I thought, and I still think, that the best way to make software sustainable is for it to work within one minute of downloading it and to have something that people can click on and make it do something. So that's me. A lot of people disagree, but that's, disagreements are good to have, aren't they? I can also do all this stuff, command line and Linux and happy days, right? But I don't. So this was the, the outcome of it. I was really happy with this. This was my first bit of software. Uh, I just looked up today's yearly stats, so there's still 2,300 downloads of it this year, which is, uh, I mean, 2016, and those are the places that people are downloading it. Um, so, this is moving on. I, I, I mentioned uh, that I was very interested in computer vision whilst I was doing my PhD. Um, there are some fantastic open source computer vision libraries. OpenCV is probably the best one. I wanted to measure malaria parasites not through counting and clicking anymore, but through computer vision. I never made that work. We, we tried a lot of stuff. I just wasn't good enough at doing it. But one of the first things that I did when I started my own company with my mate Dan, who also did a PhD here, was we started doing augmented reality children's books, and this was four years ago. So this uses all of the same computer vision stuff that I was trying to use to recognize malaria parasites in red blood cells, but it recognizes pages within a children's book and then looks up the related audio and reads it out loud and can automatically translate it into different languages. This is a complete failure, right? The product works amazingly well but it's a complete failure because we didn't work with publishers, we didn't work with distribution networks, we didn't have a marketing budget, we didn't get business involved. So we got a free pass on this in the end because we were able to sell the technology to another company, uh, so that was very good. I can't tell you which one, sadly. You can look it up, I think. There's some rumors, they are true. <laughs> okay, so... Um, <laughs> That's only our leads again, so any of you from Leeds will know it. If you've got the bus here, uh, you will have seen it. If you've got the train from Manchester or Liverpool or somewhere, you'll have gone past it. We have the half of the top floor of that building, and we do all kinds of things with open data. We focus on the north of England, but we will do open data with anywhere, so we've worked with 
partners in Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, Brazil, uh, Canada, all over the place. And this is one of the things that ODI Leads hosts, and this will get now into the main bit of what uh, I'm going to talk about. It hosts Data Mill North, which started off two years ago as Leeds City Council's data platform. So Leeds City Council has a huge amount of data, and it started wanting to dump it out onto the internet. It wanted somewhere to put all of that data. At the time, we helped create something called Leeds Data Mill, that's since become Data Mill North because other places, Bradford, Wigan, Durham, Newcastle, a few more, have also started adding their data there. This is the biggest local authority data platform in the UK. We have more data sets and we have more users than anywhere else. And this has been a real success because the council is publishing its data and is helping to start off some actions but there's also the Open Data Institute Leeds and LIDA here at the University of Leeds who use a lot of this data. So there's quite a good ecosystem in Leeds of people <coughs> creating, sharing and using data in the open. The fifth part of that um, people who are doing stuff with data are the private sector who are a huge uh, source of talent, money, innovation, all kinds of things. Leeds has some of the, the most fantastic data scientists uh, in the world working on really boring problems. So if you give them a really interesting problem to work on, they absolutely love it. They will bring talent and skills from boring problems such as automated credit check risks at cold credit, um, likelihood of, of uh, fraudulent claims at First Direct in the insurance department, all kinds of stuff like that. They would much rather be working on interesting projects and they can use all of the data that is here. I'm going to give you some examples of, of stuff we've done here. So, this is something that Leeds has that no other city has currently, because we have at the top left the only open data of it. This is housing land supply in Leeds. So, what I've done there on the right hand side is I've created a hex map of every ward in Leeds, and I've put on it where the houses are going to be built in the next five years. So everywhere else is looking into the past <coughs> to say where have houses been built. Nowhere else is really looking into the, into the future and saying where will houses be built. Now I tell a bit of a lie there. Everywhere has to plan into the future where the houses will be built. But they're in PDF files and there is drawings and there is raw numbers that you can't extract. This is just there as a spreadsheet and you can find out where houses are going to be built. Um, oh, I've even put a link. There's loads of other data sets on there, so there's about 30 data sets. It works in a lot of other cities as well. Uh, so we've got uh, Manchester, Salford, Bradford, Wigan, um, Newcastle, Doncaster we've got as well. Long story that. Here's another good data set that we have that nowhere else uh, has to the same quality. That is every ward in Leeds and it's for the last 10 years the number of empty homes. Now, I, I don't know if any of you have ever got involved in planning. Uh, planning is one of the major things that Leeds City Council is hated for. Every local authority in this country is hated on planning. So about a third of people hate that they don't build enough homes about two-thirds of people hope, hate that they allow homes to be built. One of the interesting things is that when you go into planning, it's a completely fact-free area for a lot of people. One of the things I've heard being involved with planning in Leeds for the last four or five years is that there are loads of empty flats don't build any more houses, right? That was actually true. So you can see here, that's uh, the city centre. There were 1.1400 empty flats in the city centre about 2008. The number's now down to about 400. That's a slightly old uh, graph, so it's actually come down even more. So what we're doing here is we're doing the job of a planning department, making it much simpler, making it free and open to anyone who wants to use it. The data is just being released by the city council. We are building tools that make that accessible. The third part of that is how do we get paid? And we'll come to that because 
None of these things that I've shown you, not this, not this, not this next one that I'm going to show you, have I ever made any money off. But we will get to that. So this is another thing that we, we built for, for planning. We take all of the areas on OpenStreetMap, which is a fantastic open data set. It's, it's one of my favorite in the world. I think probably second, Wikidata is my favorite currently. I think Wikidata is a fantastic open data source. OpenStreetMap is, is number two for me. Um, I take all of the areas that have parking in those four cities that are used for parking and I suggest to people what they could do with the space alternatively. And this tool, it does one thing, it does it well and it's used now in a lot of um, planning applications to say this is why we are not going to build as many car parking spaces as you want us to build or this is why we want to take over and convert this car parking space into housing. And again, it's powered by open data. So OpenStreetMap has the data, we build a tool that presents the data and lets people use it. Um, this, is your, this will be the last one. I said you could go to the website and play around with these other hex maps. That's uh, income distribution in Leeds by ward. So anyone who lives in Leeds will, will know it. It all makes sense if you live here. Um, this, the south of the city, especially the south city centre, is substantially less well off than the north of the city, which is very wealthy. So we present this kind of information. And I think that one of the real advantages of what we've started doing with open data is that we can present information in ways that policymakers can understand. I think we've I've got loads of people talking at the moment about how there's a disconnect between facts and politics. And I think that, that people like ourselves have to accept a pretty large chunk of the blame on that, which is that we are fascinated in detail all of the time. And if I talk to a politician about data and what the data is showing them about their city, if I said even average is going to be 10 minutes of their day that they don't have. So I've seen loads of data presented on maps. I've seen exactly this situation presented on maps and I'll tell you now that it doesn't make a difference. No one can take that to a public meeting and say this is what we're talking about. This is the level of income that we have, it's too low, this is why we're investing in new jobs, that's why you shouldn't block this new factory giving planning permission. Right? You need to be able to make that argument. These ones have really helped. So here's, here's another one that, that we, we take an open data set. In this case, this open data set is all of the bus timetables in the UK is open data set. That's a, a set, you can get it from Transline. It's in probably the worst format I've ever used in my life. It's called TransExchange. We spent a few months writing a parser that translates it into Google Trans transit file system, so that's a, an open source parser and it, it turns it into something that actually is usable. Um, and, and what we do here, if you look at, at the top right, you'll see a selection of bus routes in Leeds and Bradford. If you look at the left, you'll see the number one bus route, which goes just past here, uh, not far away. And all of the orange circles on the left are jobs, and all of the green circles on the left people and the circle is how many people there are and, and what we did was we took every bus route in the whole of the UK and said how well does this bus route connect people to jobs and this is informing the current buses bill which is going through UK Parliament hopefully soon which might allow cities to re-regulate their buses because at the moment what you see when you do this is that some bus routes have almost no connectivity, they connect no one with nothing. Some of them connect loads of people with loads of jobs that they'll never get. This is just a huge failure to you apply any data to this, to this system. Right. We'll, we'll come towards uh, some rounding up at the end. For now, I'm just bombarding you with some examples in a sneaky hope that you might find one or two of them interesting and go on to Data Mill North and look at the raw data that's there and start using it. It's clever. So, this is all of Leeds' 200 council-owned and council-run buildings 
have 30 minute monitors of energy use. The City Council don't have the capacity to analyse and use that data. They've been collecting it for 10 years but don't do anything with it. So they made a pretty bold move. They just dumped it out as open data. And pretty quickly, people just started building them the tools that they wanted. And another thing happened, which was that energy companies started com contacting them and saying, uh, you could save some money here. We could do you a better deal. This building's not performing as well as it should. This is a tool that we built. This looks at a primary school in Hare Hills. It looks at over the course of a week, different colours is different days, and the two grey colours are the weekends. It looks at how much energy they're using, and uh, it, it suggests, you know, different things. In, in this case, the main, the main learning point that we got from this exercise was that most places in Leeds don't turn off the heating quick enough at the end of the day. So mo what you'll find if you use this tool and have a look at energy use in Leeds, most buildings stay warm with the, uh, stay warm with the heating on until about six o'clock. But most people have left, especially in a school they've left. So um, this this was some interesting output um, for us. I think the real powerful use of this is when the energy companies come in and start offering special deals which, with lower energy tariffs based on the profile of use, and they can even suggest um, earn back things and. Uh, and so on so you could they will invest in energy efficiency based on what they know the energy use is and you can then earn it back and it lowers the council's bills okay here, here's a here's a this is to today this is my most used loved and hated product so if you're in Leeds you can download this app it's called Leeds Bins I've picked a simple name for this. Uh, it does what uh, a lot of councils buy in these services at quite high cost. They buy them from technology providers, people like Capita, Accenture, IBM. They'll buy in a suite of apps that they think does everything that their citizens want. And then they're locked into usually on a recurring contract, that kind of thing. This one, you just type in your postcode, pick your address, and it tells you when your bins are going to be collected. Now, I didn't think this would be very popular, but I think we're at 80,000 downloads now. I think we're at one in five households in Leeds have tried this, this app. It's crazy. So, the key here, though, is that what you see on the right is open source software that I have written at ODI Leeds, and we make open source. Anyone can, can run it. There's some issues there, which is that you have to publish it to an app store, at which point the portions of the app that are needed to make it run on Android or, or uh, an iPhone or a Windows phone, they're not open source, so you, you have some... It's, it's quite annoying. Remember I said that the, my favourite thing about this app, MetNetMaker, that I built ages ago during my PhD was that you could load it up and within one minute you could get it to do something and you can still get it to do it now. This you can't do that. Because it won't compile properly unless you've got a developer account with the relevant app store. But apart from that, it would. The key here though is that that half of it on the right hand side is all open source software. And on the left hand side is open data. So every week automatically the computers that set the routes for Leeds bin lorries publish their timetable directly to Data Mill North. So what this allows is, instead of us having to have a contract that provides a bin app and has to agree on some interchange formats, they just publish the data. Lead City Council just gets rid of it. And I think that just getting rid of data is a hugely powerful tool that a lot of people have. I'm quite frustrated by how bad science has been at catching up on that. Uh, I, I understand the incentives that exist. There's some great work recently. There was a Nature paper on it. I couldn't read it because it's closed source, obviously. <laughs> uh, fair enough. But I, I got the gist of it, right? The, the gist of it was that someone's done a huge amount of wet lab work, collected loads of data. They think they're going to get 20 papers out of it. 
but nature have released the raw open data and everyone else has swooped in and solved all of their problems instantly and they're not going to get any credit for it. Right? We have you know, brought forward scientific discovery by five years. Right? So that's the good side. The downside is that the people who collected the data aren't going to get credit for it. And I, and I think that science has been awful with this uh, and it makes me quite angry about every other week. Um, but here we go. You've got all your bin table, timetables. It's fantastic. So here are some other outputs. Moving on to me being Moni. So now we're moving on a little bit now to experimental outputs and not fully open outputs. And this is one of the things that's interesting about the Open Data Institute in Leeds as a private franchise of the Open Data Institute in London. Because we don't take any public money, we would take it if they would give it to us, but um, <laughs> national public money is not forthcoming for us. Um, that frees us up to do quite a lot of interesting work. It means that we don't necessarily have to always work with open data. We can work with some open data, but we can also work with a lot of closed data. This was a piece of work that, that I did, which, which was uh, very popular. I um, looked at every airport in the UK. I asked it for a flight to every airport, all these top airports in the world. And I said, how would you get there? And it came back and said, you fly via Amsterdam. And then that fed into the Heathrow Airport uh, assessment scheme, and we got some nice press coverage out of it. Um, obviously, the Google data that, that tells you this is closed data. But through APIs, you can have a subset of it that, that lets you make things happen. This is a very local uh, result. Uh, so, is, is anyone here an economist? I'm just going to have a look around. We're in a business school, but there's no economists here. There's a fantastic machine out there about uh, uh, a pre-computing analog computer of, of the economy. I love it. Um, so you twist little dials and gauges, and it flows water around the economy, and you do so on. Uh, economists have been really annoyingly, frustratingly bad at measuring small things. There's a big incentive in economics to do big things, <coughs> to like completely change how we understand the derivatives market and not a lot to measure whether opening a small art gallery in Huddersfield increases local well-being. Right? It's an it's a issue with scales. So one of the things that we hadn't done as a country was we spent loads of effort about five years ago moving loads of the BBC to Manchester. Well, we moved 10% of it to Manchester, and, and some fantastic people risked their whole careers on doing this just because they thought that would be a good idea. And then no one <coughs> went back and checked whether it had worked. And I, I think that's it is very frustrating to me. We never checked whether moving the BBC to Manchester worked. Just never bothered. So I went and bothered, because now, increasingly, all of the UK's economic data is open data. You can go in, you can do some fantastic stuff. And just today, the Office of National Statistics opened its new data science campus in Newport, South Wales. It's got huge teams that will provide you more open data if you ever want to check anything. I'll just talk you through what that result shows. It shows that on, on the up and down bit, it shows you the productivity of the TV, radio and film industry the change in the three years after from the three years before 2010, which is when the BBC moved. So the productivity of every worker, or the average worker, in TV, radio and film industry in Manchester doubled in three years just because the BBC was there. Turnover per employee. Productivity in this case, yeah. Uh, productivity is a real... Yeah, none of these are BBC employees. These are just associated sectors. This is like uh, a bloke who has a production company uh, half a mile away in Salford. Yeah. So we actually take out the direct effects of the BBC. It's just the impact on associated industries within the city. And that's because the you're BBC outsourcing. Yeah. 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 
Isn't that what I'm showing now? I think that's what I'm showing. I'm showing that that process of the BBC squeezing people out and taking them back in doubles the productivity of the average worker. I mean, having the BBC on your CV is fantastic. I mean, I, I could do the same. I, I could get squeezed in and out of the Office of National Statistics if I wanted to, and that would push up my salary nicely as well. Um, so I think, but this was a, this was a nice um, result. And as I say, you can, you can get all the data now. It's all open data. On, this is my personal uh, love affair here. Buses. I love buses. Uh, absolutely love buses. All the bus data, live, live data, is available as semi-open data via Transport API. You can use a limited amount of all the bus timetables and all of the bus tracking data. Uh, you've probably got apps that tell you how late your bus is or where to get the bus from. We use this now to track and create just a single number of delay. This was this morning in Birmingham. Uh, I cycle rather than get the 15 bus for obvious reasons because it was 42 minutes delayed this morning. So I wouldn't have got here on time if I could um, We also do Leeds. Leeds has slightly better buses just because it's a smaller city. Right? There's still, if you look at that at <laughs> half past five and I've got a website that shows all these, then uh, they're awful. Which you probably know. Okay. Now we're, we're shifting on from, I think every, every example that I've given here has used open data to do something. And, and the cool thing there was that I've never had to ask permission to do any of these things. I've just done them. This is now moving on to creating open data. So the more interesting part, the bit that's a bit more similar to what uh, Usman talks about earlier. So this is a website called GageMap. Uh, it shows all of the open data from DEFRA's flood monitors all around the UK. Um, that's uh, the River Air at Armley this week. I guess it rained a bit on the 22nd. Um, this was quite useful when there was a lot of flooding going on in Leeds. It's useful all around the place. This is a great example of a tool that is much better than the one that the government provide, but relies on the government's data. The problem with this tool is a problem with the government's data. So if you look up, up, that's a, a map of Leeds and Bradford. Uh, the green dots are all of the flood monitors that, that DEFRA and the Environment Agency run and publish open data from. There's none in Bradford, and yet Bradford Beck does cause quite significant flooding at times. So it's, it's largely a surface area and a runoff issue, but Bradford Beck causes some serious flooding and there isn't a flood monitor there. So, if we're in Leeds and we think that's not a good thing, what can we do about it? And the answer is that, first of all, we can join and set up a free and open network for the Internet of Things. So there is a technology called LoRaWAN, is long range radio technologies, very low power, very long range, very slow, two kilobytes per, sec uh, per hour, sorry, two kilobytes per hour, you've guaranteed one delivery per hour of a packet, but you can run a thing for years on a battery. And, and that, it works 10 kilometers from a base station. So we started working with Things Manchester, who are in Manchester, <laughs> And Things Calderdale, who are in Calderdale. And we have become Things Network Leeds and Bradford. And what's great about the Things Network is that it works to a specification that's set in Amsterdam by the Things Network. You can join lots of different components to the Things Network. We have one set up in Leeds and Bradford. You can receive signal here and send signal to the internet from one of these tiny devices. And so what we have done, that is a flood monitor. It's a river level gauge. So you can see a little aerial at the top there that connects it to the things network. There's a ultrasound echo distance measurer that fires out the bottom. 
It runs on a battery, will last for five years like that. So it doesn't need plugging in, which is a, a big cost saver. Total cost for that is about £300 for the environment agency stuff, a fixed cost of installing a full time with a monitor is tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands. And that produces data now. So we, every 30 minutes, we measure the height of two points in Bradford Beck. It's all available as open data. Uh, we're going to install three more. You can go back and forwards in time. And soon this data will be taken up and used by the flood map that I showed earlier. So it will be part of this national system on the gauge map and also the flood network. And what's cool about that is that I showed you this device. This device is open source hardware made by Flood Network in Oxford. So if you wanted, you could go and build your own one of them. You could modify it. You could change it. It's much cheaper to buy one off Ben because he knows what he's doing. But you could help him out and, and test it if you want. The network that it connects to for a gateway, which is just looks like a, an internet, you know, your home Wi-Fi router, but with an antenna that big on, you can just put that in your own home. That costs about £300. And so in that sense, for a few thousand quid, we've created a system that does exactly what something 10, 100 times more expensive would do. And there's some real data, which is pretty rare in IoT things. I don't know if you've ever gone to a, a talk that's been endlessly going on for the last five years about how I, IoT is going to change everything. I, I've heard that IoT is going to change everything so often from people who don't have one single device and they just seem to sell consulting on it. This is the next thing. This is where my uh, failure turns to success. So my, my failure was in uh, computer vision because I just wasn't a good enough programmer to do computer vision. But now I am. Uh, so, on the left is... Uh, do you know what? There's a Microsoft person here, isn't there? <laughs> Hello. Yeah, that's a Windows 10 UWP app. Thanks very much. Um, that is uh, an old Windows 10 mobile <laughs> <phone>. <laughs> um, <coughs> They're really cheap to buy old Windows 10 mobile phones because nobody wants them. <laughs> <laughs> but, value for money. But, but they are very good value for money. And since that's going to be an embedded system, we don't want people to be tempted to, you know, take it off and ring someone, right? It's stuck to the wall at our, our place, right? So it's not going anywhere. What's fantastic though is that's a £30 phone. It's two, two and a half years old. And we just stick it out the window. And it counts the cars. It's quite easy to do computer vision and just recognise cars now. Um, we could do lots of other stuff with it as well. Like we, we could look at the registration plates and then look up the emission statistics of the car and then report the average emissions estimated from the type of cars that are driving past. Uh, we can't do that yet because the DFT's uh, number plate lookup system is really bad. Uh, but they will be fixing it because they say it already works and it doesn't. <laughs> but this is, a, this is a good example. So that, that's installed at ODI Leads. You can come and have a look at it. It uploads to this website and you can see for days, weeks, everything, what the traffic is. Now the reason we did that was because when Leeds City Council dumped out all of their data, which I was talking at the start, they said, we've got so much data we don't know what to do with it. So whatever is safe, we're just going to get rid of and let you see what we can do with it. We went, well, what about congestion? Congestion is really bad and you're planning loads of transport changes and you don't know what the congestion is because you've not given us any data. And they said, yeah, you're right. We, don't, we have no idea what congestion is in Leeds. Do you know how much money it costs to dig up the road, put a magnetic loop under the place and then set up a full wired uh, system that has to go back to headquarters and, and save it to a big... A big database. Well, it costs absolutely loads, so they don't do it. I think there's about three in Leeds. Well, we can get for 30 quid now, we can put a traffic camera, it just works all day and all night, it sits there as a single 
single uh, thing. We also run it on a Raspberry Pi, you can do that as well. We can run it on a laptop, but people like to steal laptops, so we, d we don't bother that. And then it goes on this website. So, so this is an example of, of where we've come from sharing data. So we make all the data open. If you want to have a look at that data, you just press download. To collecting data ourselves, which is here, and doing computer vision, which I've learned how to do. Which brings us to the end, near enough. So uh, one of the, the things that lets us do what we do are these good people here, and I will come back to them with their names bigger, because otherwise I couldn't be here. So the, the number one driver for me of all of this open data, internet things, sharing, open source, is, is the idea that people have to work together on things. It's not really for me, I mean, I, I, I love the building the technology side of it, but I've also seen a lot of technology just not get built because it, it was, you run out of inspiration to build something pretty quickly if no one's interested in it. What people are interested in is working together. Open data is a good way of letting people work together because it means that you can work together with loads of other people without ever meeting them. And uh, I think that's pretty good. A lot of people hate that. They go, no, no, we've got to keep people at the centre of everything. I'm like, really? I want meetings, right? I like meetings and I like people when they're needed, which is like <laughs> a few hours a week. But working together is much better when you just download their spreadsheet and you just get going, right? So we think that open is the best way to do that. Um, I'm not uh, a zealot when it comes to open. I will work with open and closed systems. Open's good, you can work with more people. Closed's good, you can sell it for more money. And that comes to the last bit. So, who are our sponsors? At Odell Leeds, the sponsors are there, including the University of Leeds. Uh, it's a, about a three-way mix of private companies. So that's Arup, KPMG, BGSS, who are a massive software company in Leeds, who no one has ever heard of. And I hadn't heard of them until they came and talked to Paul and said, can we help you to uh, do ODI Leeds? They build the data back end for a huge amount of the NHS. So there's this project at the NHS called Spine, which is for data record sharing between GPs and hospitals. Uh, a large British telecom company won a contract to... Yeah, to nameless. Yeah, well, I would, I would never <laughs> name them, but a large British telecoms company <laughs> won, won a contract to deliver that. They couldn't do it. It was a massive front page, billion pounds of wasted money. BGSS come in used loads of open source software, loads of open source tools, proper databases that work, and fix the whole thing. So uh, BGSS are fantastic, and uh, they're, they really help us out. Bloom are an advertising agency. Why an advertising agency? They are some of the best people with data that I've, I've ever met. They do the audience insight for X Factor here in Leeds. They do the advertising for the Premier League here in Leeds. There was a, uh, they do the voice as well. When you get all the annoying tweet now stuff and you get replies, or when you see an advert for the Premier League, there are hundreds and hundreds of different adverts and each one is sp specifically geared towards different audiences for what they're like. And these people are doing stuff with data that is, is really, really advanced. And at the end, they make it look good, which is quite good. Uh, we've got other organisational partners, these are people that we've worked with. And the last one, which is someone that, that's, this is just to elicit your hatred really. Um, we're now working with Adobe because they have decided that PDFs are a really good idea. <laughs> yeah. They want to make PDFs much better with open data. Um, which I think is a good aspiration, right? So they, they are, I think that the document is quite important. Uh, however much we dislike as maybe data and software people, the PDF format, the idea of a document that you can print out, present in court, stick on a notice board, 
and always looks the same is, is pretty important. And the PDF is by far the best use of those. The problem is that when you see data in a PDF, you know it's a dead end and you are retyping it or scraping it or doing something. So uh, Adobe want now to change that. So I think that is uh, the end of me. So uh, I'm very happy to answer questions and I'm here for the panel as well. Thank you very much. Currently three, and they crash every 24 hours. You never tell the truth in a presentation. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a memory leak that we can't quite fix. But the, now the app's there. We could we could add once the thing's stable, we could add them. You know, two minutes, and you could add your own. Yeah, lo love the car thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I've done a lot of work with ODI HQ. Yeah. I was wondering if you comment around the ODI network, because clearly you're you know, going off in a really you know, fantastic direction. Yeah. HQ have a particular direction, yeah. and it's an international network. So I wonder if you can comment a little bit about sure. how the network works and how you know, you're um, you know, working with, with head office. Yeah, well. so um, ODI HQ is in London, has an advocacy role, a promotion of open as a concept role. Um, and we rely on that. So if there wasn't open data, we couldn't do any of the stuff we do. So we, we, we contribute to that through the franchise fee that we pay so that they can do that bit. Um, the way that the node network has worked is that anywhere was allowed to apply to be a, a node of the ODI. About 40 or 50 places all around the world have applied. Four or five have done really, really well. So we've done really well. We are a pioneer node. The other pioneer node is in Queensland in Australia. They've done really well. The, the people at ODI Belfast have done really well. Um, some nodes haven't done so well, have stayed pretty small and, and not achieved as much. Um, but anywhere can join in. The, the real key for us is that uh, our business is not purely open data but it couldn't exist without open data. So we try and produce open data where we can. We use open data all the time, but we are not going to necessarily do the advocacy work that ODI HQ in London does. So that's the main way that we work together. Cool. Uh, so it's one more, just, yeah, just one more question. Okay. Uh, sorry, so this is just a, a relatively quick question. I, I was curious if you knew about the big data hubs in the United States, the four regional ones, and if there's any partnership, because what you're doing sounds reasonably aligned with them, and if not, maybe there should be. There maybe should be. Um, the, only, the only people that I know doing the uh, uh, big data stuff in the US are their NVIDIA team, because of the... NVIDIA will provide you with fantastic graphics cards. And they're actually not in the US, they're in Canada, aren't they? So it's uh, just North America. Um, they will give you fantastic graphics cards if you can give them a reason to give them to you. Because you can do fantastic data analysis with them. And Chicago, so I, I know one or two people at Chicago, the, the smart city type stuff. But now I should ask you about where they are and what we should do. and Because and the idea is that once we've built the tool, and once there's some data, my dream, and I, uh, an unpopular opinion, is that the government should do a lot less of setting standards in open data. That different players should work to their own standards at first. And then at some point, the government should come in and demand that they sit together and say, look, look at all your rubbish standards. They all look kind of the same, don't they? And you've all built these tools. Wouldn't it be better if you just used one? And that's, uh, we've been trying to get the UK to think much more like that. That's how the Netherlands works on setting data standards. We would do really well to, to copy that. Um, so 
yeah, I'd love to work with the, the US places that have led on this. If we can just copy all of their data structures, which they would always be happy to let us do, then we can copy all of their tools. Again, everyone's happy. It would be fantastic. I don't want to have to write more software than I need to. Okay, thank you. Thank you.